Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today, we've been talking, this is, I want, um, we've been reviewed a little bit about what I will say is uh, biology for computer scientists. Last class, we talked a little bit about what I would call computer science for biologists. Namely, the, we talked about the basics of algorithm analysis and the fact that there are these problems that are hard to solve, that are NP-complete, okay? And um, what I'm going to now talk about is what I would say is the, the last prerequisite type of thing, or thing to be a background information before we plunge into something real, which is just an awareness of what the data sources are that are out there. So there is algorithms. Algorithms are important. Biological problems are important. The other thing that's kind of important is the fact that there is a tremendous amount of data that is out there that is provided in, in you know, computer analyzable format that one should be aware of. Because a lot of experiments that biologists do these days, they do biology experiments in the lab, but you also do experiments, they'll talk about doing an in silico experiment. That would mean a computational experiment to learn something. And the reason why you can do that is because there is so much data from so much previous work that is available, okay, um, for analysis, you can do very important things. So the most important, let's say, resource that we're going to talk about in here, as far as we're concerned, is a database called GenBank. Um, GenBank is the um, NIH's uh, sequence gen main genetic sequence database. And it's a collection of basically all publicly available DNA sequences. And you can go to this URL, and you should be able to get it. Again, na nationalinstituteofhealth.gov, okay, National Library of Medicine. That's a, a division of the uh, NIH that is de dedicated to curating data, you know, de curating data and stuff like that. Um, and what's interesting is, like I said, it contains literally every database, every um, what you DNA sequence that has ever appeared in any publication, ever, okay? In fact, most journals, if you have a respectable journal in the life sciences, if you generate any DNA sequences in the course of your research, you have to put it in GenBank before your paper will get published. This means that you're sort of you're sharing. I mean, somehow, you know, normally when you collect, you, you know, spend a lot of time collecting data, you might say, ah, I want to own my data and keep other people from using it so I can look at it more and more. And the, there's a, a tradition of sharing here. If you want to publish your paper, you have to put all the data, that you, all your DNA sequences you obtained in GenBank before publication. Okay? And that means it's a very valuable resource. It's a very large and fast-growing resource. So this is a graph I have of um, the growth of GenBank as a function of time. And as you notice, again, this start, it started, I think, in 1982. This graph seems to go to about 2008. If you look at the number of sequences or the number of bases of data in here, the basis is in the billions. It looks like 100 billion at that point. The sequences is in the million. It's about 100 million as of a couple years ago. The number of sequences in GenBank grows exponentially, okay, with time. And um, in fact, that's, that, that's happened since pretty much since it's got set up, and it's continuing to happen today. So there's an incredible amount of sequence data out there, more and more, and it's all in GenBank. Any questions about that? So the interesting thing about GenBank is that there's a lot of sequence data there. There's essentially anything that was worth publishing, and there's anything that anybody else felt they wanted to insert, okay? So in fact, um, there's one thing about GenBank is that there's a great deal of redundancy. If I sequenced a gene in a chicken, okay, I might stick it in even though somebody before me had sequenced that gene in a chicken, right? Maybe there's one or two bases difference between my gene and theirs, or maybe I didn't know that they were having it, right? Um, so basically, anybody can stick a sequence in GenBank. If you have nothing to do this weekend, you can type out a letter, a sequence, and insert it in GenBank, OK? So the good news is that there's a tremendous amount of stuff there. It's not well curated. Anybody can do it. It's very repetitious, but it is an unbelievable resource for people to use, OK? Any questions? And the size of this is such that problems about searching GenBank 
this is a large thing to search. You know, computer scientists may say, oh, I searched the internet, I'm Google, okay? This is still an amazing thing to try to search, especially because the queries are quite different. Yeah? Because you can be anyone to put information in there, um, is there a problem with accuracy? Is there a problem with accuracy? Well, there is what we would call the junk in the database. The answer is, there is, is what it is, okay? And so when you read, it's like, is there a problem with accuracy on the web, okay? The answer is yes, but it's still a useful resource, right? So, you know, you have to know what you're, you know, what you're, what you're looking at, okay? And, um, you know, you may decide how much you trust it, don't trust it, okay? You know, in general, I would say, you know, people are not drunkenly adding sequences to this thing. But on the other hand, it is often the case that, for example, there are older sequences there. So you could imagine a world where the first person to sequence something, sequencing at one point was much more tedious and costly than it was. The earliest sequence probably had a lot of errors in it, okay? And, you know, maybe there's newer sequences that, that, that are more accurate, okay? And so you might imagine a world where you might worry about the age of your sequence, okay? You might worry about you know, the, the relevance of it. But basically, the main thing is the problem, I would say, is redundancy. That there's a lot of stuff there that occurs many, many times. And so if you ask, say, here is a gene in chicken, find me the closest match, you might get a zillion copies of the gene in chicken from all the zillion people who felt they had to add their version of it. Okay? So I would say redundancy is probably a bigger problem than out-and-out -out junk. That would be my interpretation of this. Well, there's any sequence people who want to argue or expand on that, that's fine. Any questions? Okay. So, um, so what do you do with a sequence database like that? Um, one of the things that you do that is that you use a program called BLAST. BLAST is a sequence search similarity search tool. You might think of it as the Google of the, uh, the, the, the gene sequence data. But it does different kinds of queries, okay? So for example, what you're typically interested in is if I type in a sequence of a gene, what are the most similar genes out there, okay? And that actually now is not like Google an exact matching alignment, right? It's not a question, there's no words really in the DNA sequence. There's a long string of A, C, Gs, and Ds, and you want to find where is there a sequence with a hunk of A, C, G, and D that is similar to what I'm giving you in an interesting way. And that you can do these kind of queries fast enough that people put a search engine for this on the web is an amazing thing. And we'll talk a little bit about how BLAST does its thing. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So BLAST is a big thing to do. The other thing to note is that there's lots of other kinds of databases out there. So the world, uh, the bio, you know, one thing that the biologists have done a lot better than com you know, computer scientists is they, they know the need to share. They, they know knowledge builds on other things. We don't reinvent the world every time we do something. And so there's a zillion databases and a zillion tools out there if you know what you're looking for. One, for example, is something called SwissProt. Okay? That is a curated sequence database. So one thing that you might say is, well, gee, GenBank had all these zillions of sequences, and there's all this redundancy and, you know, drunken people who submitted sequences. What GenBank, what SwissProt is, basically they have a, a large number of biologists whose job it is to sift through this, decide when a new sequence comes, is, is it interesting? Do I trust it? Does it measure up to my standards? Is it properly annotated? Okay? And you can imagine having human curated databases of a lot of this stuff. The human curated databases should be larger. I mean, it should be more accurate. But on the other hand, you know, if the number of sequences are growing exponentially, they can't look at everything. The latest stuff isn't going to be there. And so there are trade-offs between accuracy and, you know, and your curation and raw mass. The other database that I would say is very important to understand is something called PubMed. One thing is that the difference between biologists and computer scientists, biologists read papers, okay? Computer scientists write papers, biologists read them, read papers, okay? They also write them. And what they, in particular, what they have done is PubMed is a database of all 
medical slash biological abstracts of, of every research article in a biological slash um, you know medical journal that has been published for the most part in the last 40 years and this is an amazing data source if you want to figure out what is known in the world basically the abstracts you know traditionally have a lot of the information about what the discovery is so reading the abstract alone gets you a large fraction to what's in the paper okay to a sense that probably isn't true about a computer science paper where the methods are pretty you know you're describing a complicated method and so you know databases like this are important if you work on a particular model organism let's say you're a fly person okay so you study drosophila okay fruit fly okay you would go to Flybase, and Flybase is a fl database of all that is known about Drosophila, okay? For all basic organisms, somehow the community revolves around constructing special databases of all things that are interesting to them. And so there's really a tremendous amount of data out there for people to work with, okay? And that's, that's kind of drives a lot of the computational things, is the presence of data. Any questions about these resources? What these resources are, why they're good things? Okay, and why they sort of relate to our existence. So let me show you what a GenBank file looks like. Actually, here, maybe we can zoom in. Here is an example of something that is a GenBank file. From a GenBank was the file of DNA sequences. It's a database of DNA sequences. So one way to represent, you know, the GenBank is sort of organized around sequence files, okay? Here's an example of a sequence file. What kind of information might you find there? Um, you know, this is a sequence you can find. Let's try this thing here. What do we know? We know that uh, the sequence has a, a code number, an accession number, so you know exactly what sequence this is. It has a version, so as things get evol evolved, perhaps the person who put the file in there later found some sequencing errors and corrected it. Ideally, the versions are organized so you get updates and you know what that you're working with a current or later version. It tells us here we've got a DNA sequence. It tells us when was this thing stuck in there. It tells us how long is this particular sequence. Okay, this one happens to be about 200,000 bases. Um, it tells us something about what it is. This is part of a cr human chromos uh, chromosome 10 from human. Okay, it tells us that you know what organism is it from humans tells us something about the organism that this comes from you know humans are primates primates are mammals mammals are vertebrates eventually get back to the fact that we have you know um, are eukaryotes we're not bacteria you know we, we, we have internal structures in our cells it tells us something about who wrote the paper okay so in principle most of the the sequence either somebody produced it Perhaps there was a publication associated with it. This tells you who was involved, okay? What was this, you know, who was involved? What was the publication that did it, okay? And now we know something about the sequence. What else might we know about? Let's go scroll down here a little bit. We also are told, okay, let's try uh, to chink. We are also told about features in the sequence, okay? So this tells us what? It tells us that we know that the sequence has uh, a five prime untranslated reading frame. That's some kind of a feature in the sequence that's interesting. Exactly what it is isn't so important, but it gives me a chance to talk a little bit about the biologist's words for left and right, okay? So a sequence goes from left to right, a string. If we view a sequence as a string, you know what the beginning of the string is and the end of the string, right? The beginning is on the left and the end is on the right. Does everybody agree with that? A, C, T, C. Left, right. The biologist's word for left is five prime end and right is three prime end, okay? And uh, why do they call it that thing? Well, it has to do with the fact that this is really a, not only a string, but it's representing a molecule. And there are different bonds involved. There's a five prime bond and a three prime bond. And it's a chain of these things. So don't be frightened if you hear me talk about five prime and three prime. Any questions? 
But there's other annotations. It's not just a raw sequence. It tells us here about what is the gene in, gene in this, the, basically. A gene consists of some run of bases followed by some other run of bases, followed by another run of bases, followed by another run of bases. In principle, there's this annotation here to help us out and tell us what it is. Okay? Here we have more annotations. It now tells us exactly what the range of a gene is. Okay? If somebody found a gene. Turns out genes occur in parts. It tells you where the, these parts are called exons. We'll talk about that. It tells us what the parts are. It tells us that this gene is coding for a protein. And here is the protein sequence of that, right? This, if you look at that, this is a string on a, not the ACGT alphabet, but on a 20-letter alphabet, OK? You don't have to count it, but M, T, A, I, such and such. This is a description of the protein coded for by that gene. Any questions? OK. It tells us, again, where the end of the gene is on the right side, the three prime end. That's what this is about, right? And finally, it gives us the sequence. The next 218,000 characters are going to be the pattern of A, C, Gs, and Ds, neatly spaced so you can read them a little bit, okay? Giving you the actual sequence that they found, okay? Any questions about that? That is a typical content of a typical um, GenBank file. Any questions? OK. Fair enough. So let's go back here, bunk. Sometimes we'll, you'll hear me talk, or people, when you look at these things, will talk not about GenBank files. You may hear the word FASTA file. A FASTA file is a more concise way to describe a sequence, basically just giving it as a list of characters, OK? But so there's some standard formats for producing, storing these sequences if you want to read them and play with them. Any questions? OK. So let's just keep going. Hold on. Bump, 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 bump. Let me go back to here. OK. Zoom. OK, so what I would say is the, the, the resource that you most have to be aware of, GenBank is probably the most important database. The important thing is that there is a one website. If you have to say, oh, I want to know one website to get as much you know, genomic data as possible, it's this thing called Entrez. OK, so if you Google Entrez or just type Entrez, you will go to a site, which is basically a collection of all of, of different biologically interesting databases. And it's interesting to, to, to play around and look at it, just to get a sense of the kinds of data people would have to play with. We've talked about PubMed. That was literature. We talked about GenBank. OK, that was like nucleotide sequence databases. There are other databases that are associated with protein sequences. We know that genes are DNA sequences that code for proteins. Many people really care only about the proteins. Those are interesting to them. There are databases of basically all the proteins, OK, and what the proteins mean, OK? Proteins, as we'll talk about, are really sort of molecules that bend into three-dimensional shapes. And those shapes are very interesting. And so there is a um, database called um, basically the Protein Data Bank. There are various databases uh, associated with the structure of proteins. OK? So, so as we'll talk about this later, sometimes protein, most of the time we're talking here about sequences. But these sequences fold up and do things. And the shapes of them are interesting and studied. And there are a lot of issues about them. You can find them in databases too. OK? You can find databases of, again, there's lots of things there. And I don't, you, know, I want you, to, you should browse through it just to kind of be amazed at this. Collections of genome sequences. When you sequence a whole species, 
There's taxonomical database. If you want to figure out how closely you're related to a platypus, okay, there, is a, there are biological trees of life that have been built, okay? And you can get access to this for all the species in the world, okay? You can start to see there's databases of things we'll call SNPs, which we'll talk about later, but basically the differences between people. So we'd like to know what are the common variants. If I take a look at uh, a particular gene, what are the common variants that show up in a population? There's databases that reflect that kind of data. Lots and lots of different types of data that people might be interested in. Any questions about that? Okay. So the third leg of, let's say, our prerequisite is this idea that there is just beware that there's a lot of data and a lot of resources. Somebody had to build this stuff, and there's a lot of computational issues or questions associated with that. Any questions? Okay, let me see. I actually wanted to show you Entrez, since this was now, we have this web thing here, right? Here's an example of Entrez in action. So this is, I typed in Entrez. See, I typed Entrez in Google. And I'm now confronted with all these databases I talked about, okay? Let's see what happens, okay? Let's look for Skeena, okay? That's what I always do when I get to a search engine, okay? <laughs> And what happens here, <coughs> okay? Well, actually, in this case, some of these databases have me, okay? Interestingly, there's 26 papers here in PubMed, okay? So if you look at this thing, now you can see what papers Skeen is involved with, okay? And they have to do with biology, okay? You won't find things that are associated really with computer science, but the biologically interesting stuff is here. You can find what cited it, what didn't, what the text is, what the abstracts are, okay? Lots of different, you know, let's go to, yeah, which is, here's one, oh, boom. So, so you get the abstract, you get lots of things there, right? And this is true for oh, about 20 million research papers. Okay, let's go back. Or you could look at 20 of these, the full text of the article is available, okay? One thing is that, that, that the, because the biology community cares about reading journals and journal papers, there's been a lot of fights to try to make the text publicly, you know, journal text available rather than with commercial publishers. And it's a complicated business, but they tell you, look, you can get some, some of these articles you can get. It says here that there are 6,000 Skeena nuclear DNA sequences in the database. Now, did they sequence me? No. But I had some life science papers published, some of which were where we generated sequence data along the way. And before you could get that paper published, every DNA sequence had to be stuck in GenBank, right? So if you look at these things, sure enough, boom, let's pick one here. Here's a gene that's, that was sequenced in this thing. And lo and behold, like any other D, you know, GenBank sequence, it's sitting there waiting to be analyzed, OK? Any questions about that? Okay, so you really can get access to a, uh, an amazing number of things. And what I'm going to encourage you to do on the homework is to sit there and play with this and try to do some search and get some sort of an appreciation for how much stuff is out there. Any questions about that? Okay, yes? Okay, so the question is, do I want you to memorize any one of these sequences? Okay, and the answer to that is no, okay? So the question is, what sense does it make? And what's interesting now is, what sense does it make to anybody? Okay? One thing that we should learn now is this doesn't make sense to anybody. Right? Does everybody agree with that? This is why when we're going to talk about sequencing and sequence assembly today, the first lesson is this can't possibly make sense to anybody without further analysis and annotation. Does everybody agree with that? Okay? So at that point, that's why you start looking at things like what are the annotations? What are the features that are found? Okay? So what I want you to do is, now, but now from the point of view of a computer scientist, what sense will any of this make to you? It's good to know what, what makes sense to somebody else. Okay? So if you're on an intelligence mission, okay, you're sort of sent to some community to try to infiltrate it and understand what's going on, the goal is what makes sense to them. And so it's kind of interesting that it's, I find it's a good practice to try to look at the kinds of data that they care about and figure out, try to figure out why might someone care about it. 
Okay? I don't expect it to mean a lot to you now. But it should be, hopefully you get a picture of what kind of things people start to care about, maybe why they might care about it. And on that level, I want you to investigate it. Okay? Any questions? Okay? I don't want you to drive yourself bonkers with it, but I want you to, you know, it's good to get a sense as to why people, what data is there and why people care about it. Because if you're going to say, oh, I'm going to do something with it, okay, it's good to know why it's there. Any questions about entries or resources or anything else about, you know, data that is out there, okay? The fact that the data is out there is one of the things that makes it computationally interesting because in much of the world it is impossible to get data. Certainly before the internet, computer scientists made up their own data, okay? Now they try to steal it from the internet. But the important point here is that here you've got large examples of things that are interesting, okay? And it's interesting to know why. Any questions? Any other questions about uh, any prerequisites before I'll move on a little bit? Okay. Boom. So what I'd now like to start talking about is um, I'd like us to start talking about the first, let's say, real unit in here. I'd like us to start talking about sequence assembly, okay? How genomes get sequenced, how that data got into GenBank, okay? And um, we see that GenBank has a billion, you know, has, you know, what was it, a hundred billion characters of DNA data in there, there's a hundred million sequences. How did those sequences get there? Um, so, in some sense, there was a laboratory experiment. One answer would be to say, oh, biologists did a laboratory experiment, they got sequences, and they stuck it in the database. Um, the thing that is interesting is that a lot of, to me, is that what made large-scale sequencing possible Okay, to sequence genomes, okay, sequence, you know, was really breakthroughs in computer science as much or more than breakthroughs in bio biotechnology. This is what I would like to convince the computer scientists in here. Everybody heard about the sequencing of the human genome, well, knows that the human genome was sequenced. There was a time when there was a tremendous race to be the first person to sequence the human genome first group to see, it wasn't a person, the first group, because there were huge, huge projects to read the three billion bases of a human. Um, these were big projects. But what I believe quite firmly is that the intellectual idea as to how you sequence the human genome, that idea really came from the computer scientists. And I'd like to try to prove that to you over this unit by describing, today we're going to talk a little bit about how what the technology is in genome sequencing, okay? How was the raw data collected? And how was it put together to sequence something as big as the human genome? And talk about basically two different groups that tried to do the same thing. And the difference between the two groups was largely how much they trusted the computer scientists. That's really what the difference was. And the, simplifying it a little bit, but, 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 um, the success of one of the groups was, was basically due to their, you know, basic computing breakthroughs. That's what I'd like to argue. So to prove that, I would like to show you this. This is a list of all the authors on the paper, the paper that announced the sequencing of the human genome. This is the author list of one of the most famous um, papers in scientific history called the, S the Sequence of the Human Genome, okay? And as you can see, this was a big project that involved 200 authors, okay? Where are the computer scientists? Can anybody see any computer scientists? Yeah. Where? Oh, I thought you meant you in this class. Oh, okay, the computer scientists <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> For the context of this, they don't count. Where are the computer scientists, okay? Let's look at this thing. Can we find any computer scientists? Well, let's see. Some of my friends are here, okay? Who, where are some computer scientists? Um, who do we know? Arthur Delcher is a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. She's a computer scientist. Um, where else are the computer scientists? Are there more computer scientists? Again, it's kind of hard. The person who was sequenced was this guy. 
This is the guy who, who, who arranged the, the money in some sense. He's the one, he was the biologist who basically arranged the factory or something like this that got, uh, organized the company which was called Solera that did this. He's the guy that arranged the factory. He's, he's, he is a biologist and a, a, a very good biologist. I mean, a great biologist. There's nothing, not, not to take anything away from him. But where are the computer scientists? Okay. I see some more computer scientists. He's a computer scientist. What are the computer scientists? It's funny, when I see, I'm not used to looking at this on the screen. Where else are computer scientists? He's a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm missing a bunch of them. I'm sure there's another run of these guys. Oh, Steven Salzberg. He's a computer scientist. He's actually the advisor of the guy who talked uh, at, at the seminar uh, a little while ago. Who else is a computer scientist? I'm pretty sure there's more of them here. He is a computer scientist. Okay. Okay. And he is a computer scientist. Okay. We're going to talk about suffix trees. This computer scientist is the guy that invented suffix trees, a guy named Gene Myers. And of course, if you notice that some of the people at the very start of the author list, the people who were the ones that, uh, you know, sort of are the ones that really made it count. There's the guy who gave his sequence and, you know, $100 million, or got the $100 million to sequence it. His henchman was the second author. And the computer scientist who, who led the assembly effort was the third author on this. Okay, and to a certain extent, the idea that led the shotgun sequencing, the idea that you could shotgun sequence the whole genome, is due to the computer scientist here. Okay, so any questions about that? What I want to convince you is that the computing part was a large part of the effort. I'm pretty sure I'm missing a few in here. Okay, but I think you guys get the point. Okay, yes. I can't read it from here. Is there something on there that tells you that they're computer scientists? No, scientist? these are just friends of mine. Oh, okay. okay, that's the only reason I know these guys. <laughs> that's why I know there's probably other ones that I'm missing here. Okay, but the important point here is to see that there that this, that the computer science was an important part of this process. Any questions? Okay, good. So how was the genome sequenced? Let's go through this. Oops, how do I? Uh oh, my. Oh, here we go. Bing. Okay, good. Uh oh, trouble. Next. Okay, so one of the things to be amazed by is how the scale of sequencing grew with time. Okay, the first thing organism ever to be sequenced was a virus. Okay, that's what a phage is—a type of a virus. In 1977, they had a a, a, a uh, genome of about 5,000 bases. A few years later, essentially a bigger virus something which had a, ba a genome of about 50,000 bases was sequenced. And that was the record holder for about 13 years when the first bacteria got sequenced. Okay, that was a genome of about 2 million bases. Then, only uh, less than five years later, the fruit fly got sequenced, which was about uh, 100 times bigger than, than um, the, the bacteria. And then only about a year or two later, human got sequenced, which was about 10 times bigger than the, um, than the fruit fly. Okay? Now today, there's still a lot of work in sequencing and assembly. It's still not a dead problem. It's still, you know, there's more sequencing than ever. The issue these days is actually more about faster and cheaper than larger. I mean, we've got basically, can, we've got basically got the ability to sequence genomes as large as pretty much, you know, there, there are, okay? And the real question is to see how cheaply you can do it. The first human genome cost about $100 million to sequence, okay? The goal is eventually to sequence everybody in this room for medical reasons. And, of course, to do that, they're going to have to bring the cost down from $100 million, okay? <laughs> the goal is basically to try to bring it down to about $1,000. And, they're, you know, that's actually going to happen, I would say, within, you know, within a strong, small number of years. And we'll talk about how that's possible and why and stuff like that. Any questions about sequencing project progress? Okay? Any questions? Let's now talk about um, how did you get the raw sequencing data? Okay? So what, um, basically, there are sequencing machines that uh, 
can have a property that if you give them a sample of DNA, they can generate sequences, patterns of A, C, Gs, and Ts of basically up to a given length. And this length is not too long. In the traditional, now sort of old-fashioned, but the traditional sequencing machine, you could basically generate sequences of about 500 to 700 bases in one experiment. Okay? And so this would give you, given a molecule, you could sequence not 3 billion pairs, but the basic step was a string of length about 500 bases. And the way these things worked is sort of explainable to you, given your knowledge of the fact that people can multiply, mole can, can reproduce molecules, and can measure the length of molecules. So how did sequencing machines work? The basic idea was something like this. Suppose you had a, um, what you call it, a sequence you wanted, uh, a molecule you wanted to sequence, okay? What we're going to do is, we could do PCR, remember, to make lots of copies of it, right? Now, what happens if I made copies of it? But, remember, I make copies of it by giving you, basically, a starting point and an ending point. That was the primers that were binding. And I had to give a mix of A's, C's, G's, and T's components so that these could sort of get copied in. Remember, the molecules are going to be made from A's, G's, C's, and T's. Now, suppose I give you a mix of working A's and broken A's. A broken A means it has a cap on the end, and nothing can get longer than it. Okay, it doesn't want to bind, can't bind to the next thing after it. Okay? If I give you working C's, working G's, working T's, and a mix of real of, of A's that can bind to other things, can it can extend to other things. Remember, it's sort of like the molecule is a string of bases and broken A's that can't extend. What's going to happen when, let's say, let me make, say, this is a, let's say my sequence was A, C, A, T, A, uh, let's say T, 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 just to keep it going. If I wanted to amplify this, what was going to happen? I start making copies. Some of the molecules I copies will be made out of will we'll have a bad first A, right? And that means I can't grow any more of it. Does everybody agree with that? It's not going to get longer. There's no, it's not like I'm building this chain of blocks, and this one had a broken connector, right? You can't connect another block to it, right? I'm also going to make a bunch of molecules that are of the form A. They can extend to C. If I got a working A, then it can extend to a C. It can extend to an A, but some of the copies are going to get a broken A here. Does everybody see that? And some of them are going to be A, C, T, A, T, A, and they're going to get a broken A. And other ones are going to go all the way to the end. Everybody see that? If I do this copying, I claim if I would have a mix of molecules of le four different lengths. Does everybody see that? Okay. And how can I now figure out where the A's were? We talked about a way to measure length, right? How do you measure the length of a molecule? Does anyone remember what we said? Yeah? Electrophoresis, right? What happened if I put it on this, this mix of molecules, and I put it on a plate of jello, and I ran the electric current here? Which molecule would walk up fastest? The one that was just A, right? And a certain number of steps behind it would be the ACA molecules, right? I'd see a band of molecules collecting there, right? Assume I also, let's say, mark these things with, let's say, radioactivity or fluorescence so I can see them on the gel, right? My claim is I am going to get a ladder of patterns, okay? Basically, a band whenever there was an A in that sequence. Does everybody agree with that? How do people understand the basic idea? Or if this is mysterious, I'd like to talk about this. Yeah. 
anything mysterious or any questions? Like I didn't get that. Any questions? Now suppose I did this in four separate lanes. Here I had the good and bad A's. Here I have the good and bad C's. Here I have the good and bad T's. Here I have the good and bad G's. And I now, instead of, let's say, putting it on a gel, let's say I have, or let's say I leave it on the gel, let's say I have a camera here that is going to look at the molecules when they go by. Okay? We would kind of imagine if I crank the current up here and I watch it go, what's going to happen? I am going to get, on, if I measure, look at the A camera, I am going to be, what color is A? A is G here, green here. You'll see that every time a sequence that ended in an A comes, in the green channel, I got a bump. Does everybody see that I would observe these, the, 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 the A sequences as they go by? If I did this for every single letter, as a function of time, in any one time, I should be seeing more concentration in one of the channels than any of the others, right? And that means that the next letter is, if the G channel is high, the next letter is a G. I wait a, wait a few seconds, and suddenly the next one, oh, it's a T. Okay? That means the next base is a T. Does everybody get this idea? That by basically, a sequencing machine was basically built just from copying with good and bad bases, and then measuring the length of what you get back. Okay, and from that, if you hook it up with enough electronics and imaging and all this kind of stuff, it should be clear you can build a sequencing machine. Any questions about that? How many people think they know what a how a sequencing machine works now? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, again, in the earliest days of biology, back when they were sequencing viruses, of you know, where they, where they first sequenced the first virus with 5,000 bases. They didn't have sequencing machines. They had graduate students with tubs of jello. And they actually would, you know, run this big tub. I, I couldn't find it, but I had still have one of these big gels plates, you know, these these sort of x-rays, these image photographs of a gel that they would have produced in the old day by hand, where they um, you know, prepared four channels, they let it run for a while. And then the, 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 the graduate student would go and look and see where was there a light and a dark band and try to read these things off. And after they'd run a few hundred gels or something like that, they would give them a the PhD and they would go on. Any questions? But then they built sequencing machines and now you could do these things. Any questions? Yes? Okay, so what this is showing me here, the three peaks here, in this, in this particular, you're talking about this one, I guess, right? Well, what that meant is that there was a G peak followed by a G peak followed by a G peak. That's because the sequence had a G followed, you know, was basically, up here you see it reading off, the sequence was C, T, G, 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 T, A, okay? So repeated peaks would be, you know, mean that there was a double base there. Does that make sense? In fact, one of the harder things in getting the technology was, was telling if you had a large number of things in a row. Was it a big smudge? Was that smudge six Gs or was that smudge seven Gs? Okay? But in principle, the idea should now be clear. Any questions about that? Okay? So given this, the good thing is that you could have um, get sequences of about 500 to 700 bases. And the limit basically had to do with the resolution of the gel, if you think about it, right? You have to measure each one of these bands. And, you know, molecules are small things, you know, depending upon how high you charge them, to actually discriminate between each band. You couldn't get more than about 500 or 700 bases of re resolution. Any questions? Okay. So that is how you built a sequencing machine. Okay. And this is basically just a description of what I said. Remember, they said there were four bins each labeled differently. You had a mix of functional and non-functional bases. And using electrophoresis, you separate them. And that's how a sequencing machine would work. Any questions? OK. In fact, here, again, this is an image of one of those gels. Um, again, you could see 
this is something from the old days, but basically you'd see here bands of you know where 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 things are glowing. This may have been the A band, the C band, the G band, the T band. Based on this kind of thing, you could figure it out. Okay? Any questions? And once you've got these machines working well enough, you could basically get an accuracy rate where you make, let's say, one or two percent errors. You misread one or two percent of the bases. You get about 500 bases, and it would cost you about a dollar to do that. That's a dollar, two dollars, if you have a good lab. That would be the kind of scale of what you might do with one of these machines. Any questions? Okay. Now, these days, I don't want to confuse you with this image now, because uh, sequencing machines technology has been advancing a lot lately. And there is a new type of technology that leads to a whole new set of computational problems, which sequences in a way that isn't as easy to describe. You guys understand these molecules and the broken bases and the measuring lengths. That's good. There is more chemical magic that people have developed which enables them to sequence um, huge numbers of reads that are very, very short, okay? Somehow that, that uh, they have some magic where you have a molecule nailed down to a plate and you say, is the next base an A? And the molecule will bing, light up if it's the next base is an A, okay? Call that magic for now, okay? But what's interesting here is there's new technologies for sequencing that have the property that instead of giving you 500 bases for a dollar, they will give you, um, let's say, I'm going to guess, let's say a million sets of, tw of uh, 50 bases for $5,000. Okay? So this is much better in some sense. It's better in that you're getting a large number of sequences, a million or a 10 million or a billion reads. That's good. The cost per read is very low, right? Read meaning a sequence. The problem is that the reads are a lot shorter, okay? But as we'll talk about later in the semester, these can be used for lots of things, such as, for example, resequencing you, okay? So just be aware that there are newer technologies. I'm going to talk here about the old sequencing technology, because that was what was done to sequence the original genome. And because the way genomes are still sequenced essentially use long, short reads, okay, using the same kinds of ideas I'll talk about here. But so the take-home lesson is, yeah, I understand how a sequencing machine could work, he now tells me there's even better ones that will give me these really short reads, okay? But uh, together we can use this and now try to talk about the informatics problems. Any questions? Okay, good. So what do you do with short reads? Again, if I give you a, a read of 500 bases, that doesn't tell me much about a 3 billion base human. Okay? So how can I now figure out how to sequence the three billion bases of a human? And the way that was done was an idea called shotgun sequencing. Okay? What you would do is the following. You would take the genome that you want sequenced. Okay? Somehow make, and this is a molecule, right? You would make lots of copies of this molecule. Turns out not by PCR, but by cloning. Somehow a way of making copies of the molecule. Then you take this mix of molecules and you chop it up in a blender. Okay? You know, so you cut it into lots of pieces. And now you've got, for now, let's say, a zillion pieces, a, a, a test tube with a zillion pieces of DNA, each of which is small, let's say 500 letters for now from the original sequence. What you would now do is sequence a bunch of these 500 MERS. We now know this DNA sequencing machine would let you sequence 500 letters. And what you've now got is a mix of sequences, each of which is about 500 letters, 
each of which comes from someplace on the original genome. Does everybody get that idea? The key question now is, can you put the information together? We get basically, we, we took the sequence, made copies, chopped it up in a blender, then took each molecule and essentially sequenced it. At this point, we did not have any positional information. We just had 500 bases of data, right? But now we've got lots of 500 pieces of data. How can we hope to put that mess together again? What clue would we have about how we might be able to put it together again? Yeah? Over a lot oh, alignment. Suppose, let's say, I sampled two pieces from the genome, which, in fact, were from overlapping pieces of the region. Or let's just say I took, had, took this first 500 bases and some other place maybe 100 bases down from it. We live in a world where here I've got a string of length 500 bases. Here I've got another string of length 500 bases. 400 bases of them overlap and are basically identical, right? The uh, odds of that happening by chance, let's say, is very low, OK? We can now say this probably goes overlaps the other one. And we can put them together to now get a sequence of length 600. Does everybody get that idea? By looking for overlaps, the goal should be to try to come up with a sequence that explains all the reads that we get by being, what was, this, what was the word that we used for this? We would want sort of a short sequence that explains all the data that we've seen, right? I mean, we could take all the reads and concatenate them together, right? Say, oh, you give me 500 MERS. I could put them together here. Here's a string that contains all of them. I just concatenated one after the other. But that's probably not convincing that that's the likely explanation of the genome, right? A better explanation would be a short string that contains all the data and explains it. And that gets back to what problem that we talked about? Shortest common super string. Does everybody see that? So the problem of reconstructing the sequences basically becomes shortest common super string at this point. Any questions about that? Any questions? OK. So this is how genomes were basically sequenced. OK? Yes? Why is it called shotgun sequencing? Why is it called shotgun sequencing? Um, let me think. OK, so a shotgun, I guess, I guess the original F L L F L um, etymology of the word, a shotgun is a weapon that people shoot. But it's more than that, I'm not an expert on shooting weapons, but I believe it is a weapon that shoots in a wild way, right? So if, let's say, you, you know, you're not a very good shot, okay? It shoots lots of pellets at the same time randomly. And basically, you know, so you can close your eyes and shoot someone, and you're pretty sure you'll get them, okay? And that is really the same idea as what we're doing here. Where are we closing our eyes, to, to be precise? Let's take a look at it. Where are we closing our eyes? We were randomly basically getting these pieces. And the claim was, well, if I have a shotgun that will generate enough pieces at random, then there's got to be a way to put, bring the guy down, right? And that's sort of, I guess, where the idea of shotgun, the, the term shotgun came from. It's the idea that you were randomly, basically, shooting at this thing in the hopes that you're going to be able to put it together at the end. OK? Any questions? Any questions about that? OK, good. Now, though, what do we need, though? How much data do we need in order to hope to put it back together at the end? OK? We agree that any set of strings you give me, OK, is going to, I can, I can concatenate them, but it's not going to be the sequence I want, right? The question really is, if I'm not going to concatenate them, I am going to have to rely on overlaps to put them together to determine whether one thing overlaps by enough, the other thing by enough. OK? To be meaningful. It's now clear that I have got to, if I'm going to sequence a genome, I need more raw data than the actual genome gets. 
Does everybody agree with that? If I want to sequence 3 billion bases of human genome and put it back together again, it's not that I need 3 billion bases of data because I need much more than that, okay? I need to have enough that I will have, expect to have overlaps, okay? Long enough that I can expect to put it back together. Does everybody agree with that? And there starts to be an important question then, before I start doing a sequencing project, how much data should I need so that I could expect to put it back together again? Does everybody see that? So the problem that you tend to get, if you're randomly sampling sequences, let's say we're randomly sampling reads, the big problem that I have to avoid is that there be some genome sequence where I, that there not be some genome sequence, part of the original genome, where I never sampled a read from. Does everybody agree that if I never sampled any read from that point, okay, I have no hope to put it back together again, right? If there was a chunk, a small chunk of basis here where I never got any read data, I have a gap in my knowledge. Does everybody agree with it? That I can't hope to put back together again. So one that's a minimum notion of where I need to think about in order to put it back together is I need to sample with enough frequency that I'm pretty sure that I will see every base, okay? And not only will I see every base, but I will see every base overlapped by some other fragment enough that I'm pretty sure that I, I can put it back together. Does everybody see that? So the original analysis of how much sequencing data you need was something called the Lander-Waterman equation. Okay, These are two math guys, both of whom are quite famous in the biology world. We'll talk later about the Smith-Waterman sequence alignment problem. This is our, our algorithm. This is our Waterman. I told you that there were two se genome s projects that tried to sequence the genome at the same time. One was Solera's, which I've talked about. The other was a public group led by a guy named Eric Lander who got his PhD in mathematics. He was a mathematician who became a real biologist, real, real biologist, okay? And in fact, to the head that he was the one that headed the public effort in the race against Solera to sequence it. And one of the steps that they looked at earlier was how can you analyze how much sequence do you need? Okay? And they came up with the following equation, which I want you to look at here, which says that if you do s random sequencing, let's say that we are doing n reads, okay, each of which has length L. So n is how many sequences we're going to get, reads. L is about 500 for the Human Genome Project. That's basically what we talked about, right? Um, let's say that we only trust an overlap if the overlap is greater than or equal to t. Maybe t is 100 bases or 200 bases. It's a question of how much you trust it, right? And let's say that the target that we're trying to sequence is T. T was 3 billion in the human genome, right? The lander waterman equation said that the expected number of gaps you would have if you did a project with N reads, okay, where each read was of length L and the overlap of question was T, and you wanted to sequence a total genome of this size, it said that the number of, of, of gaps would be something like this, okay? Now, why does that make sense, okay? Let's try to look at the equation and try to read it and see if it makes sense, okay? I don't want to derive it, but I want to try to make it plausible. How many gaps are there? Let's first, first of all, when I look at this thing, there's E. What is E? E is that funny thing that came up when you analyzed logarithms and exponentials and things, right? How many people remember seeing E at one point? Where would E crop up from here? 
Let's look at an example. Let me explain first where the E comes from. Okay? If you remember, suppose, let's say, we consider a assembly problem. Okay? How many gaps there would be if we had a sequence where we used n reads? Okay? Each read, uh, n is the size of our mount target, n is the number of reads. Yet each read was only of length one. Okay? Let's think about the limiting case here. Suppose I gave you one base reads. Okay? This molecule is of length n. I'm going to give you n samples. How many gaps would we expect to see then? Okay? Does everybody understand the basic premise now? These are extremely short reads. We obviously can't hope to overlap them because they're only one base, right? But how many things won't we see if we did n such reads? My claim is, suppose we look at the ith position here, okay? What is the probability that no read hit it, right? We come in a world where bunk, 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 right? Each read, if it's not going to hit this target spot, what's the probability that it's going to miss that spot? I claim it's n minus 1 over n, right? There's n possible places that read could be, right? There's only one we don't want it. If we want to say there's going to be a gap here, there's only one place it can't be, right? Now, what is the probability that it happens that if we do this n times, okay, all of them miss this spot? Well, it's the probability the first one missed times the probability the second one missed, dot, 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 right? So it's this probability to the n. Does everybody see where that n comes from? It's the fact that we're doing n such samples. Does everybody, does, how many people does this make sense to so far? Okay, any questions from our biologists or anybody else? Like, where does this come from? The interesting, so, so this should be clear that the probability we leave a gap is n minus 1 over n to the n. What does this evaluate to? n minus 1 over n gets closer and closer to 1, right? Raising 1, multiplying 1 to a bigger power, okay, to the n gets, um, what you call it? In principle, the more you raise something, the bigger it should get. But as 1, no matter how much you raise it to the power, stays 1. Does everybody get that? There's a tension here between this thing getting closer to 1, and this thing exponent, growing up. And the limit of this, as you learned in high school, was 1 over e, okay? That this equation comes out to being basically 1 over e, okay? And that's where the e comes from. Any questions about that? Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? What other parts of this term can we explain? Let's try this thing. Another thing that we can explain is, if we look at this thing, well, let's go back to the equation again. What else looks funny here? Here, if you get this part, what is this part? N L minus T over little t over big T. What does that mean? Well, L minus T is the length of the read minus the overlap required for something good to count it as a significant thing, right? How much data could a read hope to add to our knowledge of the world? Well, it's the length of the read minus the wasted somehow stuff, which is necessary for the overlap. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So how much total good data do we get? Well, it's the number of reads times the length of the read, basically, minus, you know, minus the overlap, right? Does everybody see that? This has got to be long, total amount of interesting data has to be larger than the whole length of the genome we're trying to sequence, or else we clearly don't have enough information. Does everybody get that idea? Yeah? Yeah? 
the overlap wouldn't have to be overlap on both sides. So have to overlap on both sides. I'm still waving hands a little bit. Okay. But does, that, does everybody get the idea that that it makes sense somehow a little bit to discount the length of the read by what you have to punish yourself for overlap? It should be clear that if you didn't need the overlap, you need less data than if you did need the overlap. Does everybody agree with that? And if somebody comes by and says, oh, I need to overlap 499 bases or else I don't trust it, you need a lot more reads, right? The interesting thing here is basically, what is this NL over T? T, big T was the length of the genome, right? You needed at least enough data to see the genome interestingly once. N L minus T is the amount of interesting data you got, potentially. Dividing it by the length of what you want, that fraction is how many times did you see the genome that you saw, right? Let's think about it that way. A way to think about what this term means. It's how much, the, what is the ratio of the raw data that you have to the length of what you're trying to sequence? If you don't have at least one, it's hopeless. But you may need more and more of that to make the probability of there being a gap low enough, okay, that you hope it's not going to be there. Any questions about that? So that sort of explains the term here. So I want to say this is explained by what we'll call coverage. The E thing is explained by this... Uh, you know, sort of this hand-waving thing here. This is the probability that, that any particular base be left open. The expected number of gaps is the length of the sequence, n times the no probability that a base is left open. That sort of explains the outer n times this. Any questions about that? Yeah? How do you know the length? T, capital T? How do I know the length of the molecule that I'm going to sequence? That's a good question. How do I know the length of the molecule before I sequence it? Can anybody figure out an idea? Suppose, let's say, you want to sequence the turkey genome. In fact, the turkey genome was just sequenced this month. They just published the, the sequence of the turkey genome. How would we figure out the length of the turkey genome? If you were a biologist, what would you do? Any ideas how you might figure that out? Well, how do you sequence? You want to know just the length of the target of what we want to sequence, right? How did we know the human genome was 3 billion letters long? How did we know the human genome was 3 billion letters before we sequenced it? How would you do an experiment to tell you that? What might be an idea of how you would do it? Well, how would you do the experiment? Okay, do we have, you want to know if something is 3 billion letters long, how would you figure that out? Why not use the jello? Right, exactly right. Okay? In principle, the way that you would figure that out is you take your human genome, make put lots of copies here, you put it up a big gel, you know, a big big thing, and you wait long enough and see how fast it chugs up the jello, right? And based on that, you should be able to come up with an estimate as to how long the molecule is without doing anything, right? Before you don't know too much about it. Right? So in principle, you can know the expected length of what you're trying to sequence before you do any of the work, right? You know how big the molecule you want is. You know how, what your assembly requirements are and what the reads that you get are. The real question is, you are, you're, what you are allowed to control is N, the number of reads you get. How many reads would you, if you had this formula, how many reads would you want to use, okay? Given that T is known, big T is known, because it's your, you want to sequence the turkey genome, okay, and you know the length. You know your machine can overlap, get 500 bases at a time. You know that the overlap that matters is 100. What is N? How many reads should you get? according to this formula. How many reads should you pay for? Remember, each read cost you about a dollar. Okay? 
it would seem that what you want is, you want to ensure that there's no gaps, or very few gaps, right? You want to find what is the smallest value of n, such as the number of gaps is small enough that you don't care about that anymore, right? Does that make sense? n is the number of reads you're paying for. You want to pay for as few reads as possible, okay? And the claim is you want the number of gaps to be 0 or 1 or something like that. This will tell you how many reads you need. Any questions about that? Okay, so this is good. Now the bad thing about it though is that when you solve this formula and you take a look at it, you start to see what is the coverage that you need by this method. The coverage is the ratio of the raw data that you get to the size of the target that you want, right? You want the 3 billion bases of the human genome sequenced. The amount of raw data you got was basically the number of reads times the length of the reads. The ratio of this is what we call the coverage. Okay? And our goal is to find what is the smallest amount of coverage you need to get the number of gaps small. When you look at the, the Smith-Waterman, the, uh, the, the Landers-Waterman equation, you end up getting, if you were dealing with a bacterial sized genome, to get the number of gaps to be quite small, let's say less than 20 or so, or ideally down to 1, you need a coverage of about 10. That's what this is telling you, right? If you wanted to really sequence a bacteria accurately, okay, then you needed to sequence basically, if it was a 1 million base bacteria, you needed about 10 million bases of raw data. If you were willing to live with a certain number of gaps, let's say, let's say you were willing to live with 80 gaps, well, now you could get away with a coverage of 5, which is half as much. Does everybody see that? Again, this is now the difference from here to here is half the cost of your experiment. So it's part of an optimization question here in how accurate do you want your data at the assembly at the end as a function of what you're willing to pay for. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Any questions about that? But going on with this, if you look at the fruit fly genome, to sequence the fruit fly genome without gaps, you need a coverage of about 15, something like that, right? So it's not just that the fruit fly genome is 100 times longer. You've got to sequence it maybe twice as much to twice as much coverage in order to make sure you don't get gaps. Right? Does that make sense? And for the human genome, it's even worse. You need a coverage of 20 or 30 in order to make sure you don't have gaps. Okay? So the problem here is not only are you sequencing the genome once, you're sequencing it 30 times. Any questions? Okay? So that's why it would get to be expensive. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so that's part of the strategy of putting together a sequencing experiment. What coverage do you want? And again, there's a lot of other things that go on in designing one of these sequencing experiments. It isn't all done by the computer scientist. Okay? One interesting strategy is that there's some, sometimes, with some, most technologies, you could sequence 500 bases from each end of a molecule, okay, and get some information that might help you. Let me say that I'm probably saying this wrong. Suppose, let's say, you had a fragment that you wanted to sequence that was about 10,000 bases long, okay? Using the sequencing machine in the right way, you could get 500 bases from this end and 500 bases from that end. Okay? What's interesting about that? You get two reads of length 500. That's good. But you also get some extra information. If you know that they came from different ends of a molecule that's about 10,000 bases apart. Does that make sense? Now you know when you put it together, 
if you put this fragment over here, the other one is going to lie about 10,000 bases downstream from it, right? So if you can get some extra experimental data from these double-ended reads, that might help you put it together more accurately. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And in fact, in the real sequencing experiment, part of the assembly problem is making use of this ge geometric information as well as just overlaps. Any questions about that? Okay. The more data they can give us to help us put it together, the better. Okay. Any questions? So basically, there were two different groups that were trying. Yeah, question. Uh, when you're matching the strings, you have to ensure that they are oriented in the same way. Like you don't want to match the last 400 instead of the first 400 in your uh, joining. Okay. So what's important there is you have to know the orientation of the string. Each string, remember, there was a five prime end and a three prime end. When we got the sequence, it would lie.